thank you, thank you for those that have already joined us in the room. Um, clapping is a great way to release any negative energy that builds up in the body. So it's also really good to get us refocused and grounded. We are so excited to start with our next session. We have an amazing panel. And after this panel, we will be getting into our awards recognition ceremony. So we know some people might be just getting situated, but gonna be strickling in the room. All right, I would like to invite to the stage now, uh, Serena Sachs Mandel will be our moderator. Uh, and our session is titled, A New Way to Lead 21st Century Learning Trends. We have speakers Belangi Perez, Perez Torres, Dr. Tina Person, and Dr. Nita Nagra. We can please give a round of applause for our next panelist. Come on, stage. In the age of rapid advancements and digital transformation, traditional educational approaches are no longer working. They're not enough to equip students with the skills they need to thrive in the 21st century and beyond. Our panelists today will showcase innovative educational models, cutting edge technologies, and pedagogical breakthroughs reshaping the learning landscape. If you need for the slides. Okay. okay. All right. Hello. Thank you for having us. Um, Mike? Oh. Are you good? Serena, change the other mic. Switch mics. Try the other one. No, the other mic. Hello. Hello. Ah, oh, now it's working. Uh, we have been speaking for about a week now, getting ready for this, and just enjoyed each other's uh, conversation and our perspectives, and uh, we hope you like the session. So we're first going to introduce ourselves, and, uh, and then we're going to show a video, but hold on, um, just give us a sec. Uh, I'm Sarita Sachs Mandel. I'm the global CTO for education at Microsoft. And I've been at Microsoft for about three years, and prior to that, I was CIO of, uh, for a decade at two different very large, diverse, innovative school districts where we had tremendous results uh, improving student outcomes, graduation, reading, math, uh, test scores, uh, acceptance to colleges, SAT scores, across every, every demographic. And uh, so I really learned a lot about personalization and leveraging technology to transform education. Prior to that, I do have about 25 years in commercial IT at IBM, Walt Disney World, and a number of others. And then education became my purpose and my passion. And so for the last uh, 12, 13 years, I've dedicated my life to transforming education with technology. So, Nita. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nita Negra. I'm the CEO and founder for my company, Fit to be Strong Leader, which is essentially a leadership consultancy. Um, a little bit about my background. I have a doctor of education in, um, which specializes in leadership. I have a master of mental health nursing and also a bachelor of science in psychiatric nursing. Um, I've been working in mental health services for over 17 years. And I've been working in healthcare leadership and as an educator for almost about 10 years now. Um, so in addition to my um, company, I also work currently as a faculty member for a psychiatric nursing program, as well as an administrator for a hospital. And I'm really grateful to be here and to be learning um, amongst all of the amazing people in this room. Okay, thank you. I'm also proud to be here. And uh, I'm far away from, I'm from Sweden, uh, Scandinavia. So I had a long flight to come here, but it's absolutely amazing to be here. My name is uh, Tina Persson, and uh, I'm run running my own company, Passage to Pro, that is an educational and, and coach company. And that is part of what I usually say, a hidden dream. You know, hidden. I didn't know the dream existed before I found it in a deep hole uh, some many years ago. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm trained and sort of assistant professor. I uh, spent uh, in chemistry and biology, and I spent six, seven years in Germany at the Max Planck Institute. That is number three in the world. So I, I was trained in a very academic environment, top elite kind of attitude where articles and citations is everything. 
and that was in the 90s. And believe it or not, what I was doing science on was RNA. So I was part of that RNA world that at the time was growing a lot in California, United States, with Tom Czech, uh, Jennifer Dudna, and etc. And believe it or not, but Jennifer Dudna and I, we were postdocs at the same time and attending Santa Cruz conferences. So it's interesting how life comes back. Uh, however, I came back and I wanted to start my group and I realized I can't stay in academia. The environment is so extremely toxic yes. and I developed to a person that I didn't want to be. Uh, I didn't find any role models and then when I saw the people I said, I don't want to be like them. And I could see I transformed to something. So a long story short, but I was in a very deep hole, I can say it was sort of a Grand Canyon, <laughs> yeah. it's a long way down and it was a long road up and I had many health issues that I had to deal with. But my hidden dream came true and I hope we're here with the award, I will tell a little bit about what, what happened. But I'm super proud to be here and I'm helping today professors, lecturers, postdocs and PhD students to transform their lives and particularly to leave the academic environment, which is their family, so they can start a new career in the corporate or any other industry. So thank you. I'm Belangi perez Torres. I am Director of Hygiene Strategy and Operations, as well as Vice President for Professional Development at the New York State Dental Hygienists Association. So I focus a lot more in um, not just a dental hygiene profession, but all their supporting roles that help them within our organization. So at Aspen Dental, we have over a thousand practices in 45 states, and we open up a dental practice a week. So with that type of growth, t training um, and developing our people is going to be very critical in order to continue to scale and support um, the profession as well. Sorry. <laughs> we have a diverse panel, but we're all super passionate about education. And, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about education and technology and what's changed, what's cutting edge, what's new. And I, I showed the group a video that uh, I show my customers all the time. And I've seen this video many times, and every time I see something else in it, it's about education, it's about technology, but ultimately, it's, it's about people and it's about changing lives. And I just want to preface it in case folks don't know, from a pedagogical standpoint, if students don't learn to read by third grade, they will be impacted for life on their ability to be successful. So you read to learn and uh, you learn to read and then you read to learn. And so third grade is kind of a magical mark. And uh, unfortunately, we do have a lot of struggling readers and since the pandemic, the pandemic changed everything. We lost a decade of growth in reading scores and math scores. And uh, so now in this post-pandemic moment, uh, we are trying to help our students catch up so that we don't lose a generation of, of a workforce that's capable of embracing what we know is coming. Every job is technology-based and AI is infused in every job now. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we'll talk about that more. But in the meantime, I wanted to show you a quick video on how we can leverage technology to help improve reading fluency. So with that, can you please start the video? Literacy is so important and it's my job to help the kids grow in that and to see the value in that and to break the mindsets of like, oh, I'm just a bad reader, I don't like to read. I don't have to worry about other people just looking at me and staring at me. It's just reading to myself, sort of, but on camera. When I came across Reading Progress, I was able to say, hey, I've assigned a passage to each and every one of you guys at your reading level, I want you to record you reading this passage. I was surprised that when the whole class came back literally within 10 minutes, everyone was already done. Having that recording, I'm able to spend ample amount of time to analyze. And instead of using my instructional time, it allows me to use my planning time to figure out 
how do I intentionally approach every student? The whole class, this is what I'll teach them, and maybe this one specific individual student, I need to address with him or her this specific area. Reading progress has really motivated a lot of kids to work harder and kind of gave them ownership of their learning. Well, as a mother and an educator, you know that the conference with the student is the most powerful piece. It's not necessarily them reading and recording. It's what you do with that reading and with that recording. And she's able to capitalize on that even faster now. It probably helps me be, be a better reader because I can actually listen to myself. And if I did say a word wrong or something, I'd be able to say it better than next time because I know that I said it wrong. Struggling readers, they struggle, so they avoid reading. And by avoiding reading, they struggle even more. Um, and so it's been really cool to watch how my kids are you know, reading more at home. They're more excited to read in the classroom. They have their personal goals that they've made, not me. And so they're excited to work. Coming from an administrative perspective is that this isn't just a classroom tool. Because we have so much access to data that this is a powerful tool to change the learning trajectory of a building. But watching her grow in her reading, it's been a, a joy for me. I used to love reading as a child, and I wanted that for her. Now, and that way you see at, I'm more confident. I'm less worried about it. I get worried about a lot of things, but reading now is one of the things that I'm not worried about anymore. I want all of my students to, to get to the point where they know what it feels like to get lost in a book. Favorite part is when I get to a really interesting part in the book and then I can't stop reading it and it's really fun. helping them to learn to read. I am not used to using a mic. <laughs> Usually I'm like all wired up. So the first question I have for the, the group is, how will emerging technology change the learning experience of the next generation of learners? And I think you saw examples of that in the video and a picture tells a thousand words. So Bella, I'm gonna start with you in uh, your practice. How are you, you leveraging technology? Yeah, I want to say that the gamification industry has really impacted modern learners, not just with the young generation, but even in adult learners as well. Um, the young millennials and the um, older Gen Z that's entering the workforce, they want to continue to learn in that uh, social environment. If you think about video games, they can connect virtually anywhere with anyone. They're, as a team, they can uh, work together in complex solving complex solutions, navigating through complex areas, and achieving a goal together. Well, they want to continue to do that even in the workforce. They want to work with a team together, supporting each other, and achieve goals. And so in the, um, we know there's a lot of workforce gaps, and talent development is going to be more important for organizations. And how do we continue um, to leverage some of these tr learning trends into upskilling their talent for their growth and development down the road? Uh, so I know a lot of universities are starting to offer micro-credentialing, stackable credentials. Work, a lot of organizations are now recognizing we don't have a lot of qualified candidates. So what is a, could we look at other ways? And maybe a lot of adult learners are in a moment in their life that they cannot fully invest in a master's degree program or higher education. Stackable credentials has been an alternate solution where they can learn focused skills set in in-demand skills and then digital badges to promote it, whether it's a LinkedIn so recruiters can find them. I'm also seeing it in, uh, email signatures of folks displaying their digital badges in a specific um, skill set and area. So I'm seeing a lot of the gaming trends um, coming into the workforce with our, our adult modern learners. Thank you. Uh, so what I'm hearing is that the adult learners, and I, I, I am hearing this a lot as the global CTO, that students are coming out of high school or higher ed without all the credentials that they need to actually do their jobs. And so work organizations are taking on the task of training people to actually do their jobs. And uh, so that's, that is one thing that we're seeing with, with um, trends in, t in education right now. Uh, so I just want to go to what are some of the 
other top trends in this post-pandemic moment. And I'll just say one of the things that I see that I've heard from this group a lot is the impact on mental health for students and educators. It's, it's been very, very significant. And I will say the one good thing I see, the silver lining, uh, is that, and I used to be um, the chair of the board of the largest mental and behavioral health care organization in Central Florida. And at that point, we were very concerned with the stigma of mental health. And I see, even in kids in this post-pandemic moment, that they're not afraid to talk about their feelings or even if they're not doing very well. So I think that that, that is good, that we are here talking about it. It's OK to not be OK. Uh, but I want to ask the other panelists if you want to comment on this post-pandemic moment. Tina, I think you wanted to say a few things. My microphone is working here. <laughs> Susie, you know, I will, you know, take it from the perspective that I'm coaching a lot of people with very high degrees. You know, they have PhDs, they many years of postdoc lectures, mm -hmm. even professors, assistant professors like myself, and they need to be retrained too. I mean, think about it, that you maybe have spent your whole life in an academic environment, you're 35 years old, maybe up to 40 sometimes, and they meet me and they are not attractive on the market, not only because of the skill sets, because there are many of these transferable skills, but also from you know, the mindset and the attitudes suffering from imposter syndrome. And then start to talk about unlearning, you know, listening to some speakers here before me, it's like, why? Tina, you can't mean it. You're my coach, you should help me. And you are telling me I have to unlearn my degree, everything, is that not worth anything? <laughs> and I say, yeah, but it is what you deal with it in the future. Because what's going to happen in the next 10 years is more than are happening in the last 100. And now I want you to take a second thought. Last 100. I talked about my dad standing, seeing Berlin burning. When that happened, he had no phone. <laughs> no electricity, and he is now having an iPhone. I mean, you can see the development, and it's going to happen more in the next 10 years. And this is what I have when I have these highly educated people coming to me, and to change and transform that mindset is, of course, extremely challenging because it's easy to go down in that hall that we heard, everything I've done has no value. So this is also skilling up. It's easy to say, but it is coming back to mental health acceptance, that everything I have learned have a huge value. I just need to use it differently, and it's all up here in my head. And you know, I've been in that hall myself, so I know what it takes, so it's absolutely possible. So that is what I would like to add to it. It's not only children. We have big children, like me, yeah? We are all children, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> We have to be children in the next 10 years to have fun and learn to fail and be a community and a big childhood kind of caring community. Thank you. I love that. Bita, I want to ask you, what concerns do you have about the future using technology for education and how will we address those? Uh, thanks, Serena. So I'm just kind of, uh, I guess, build off of what Tina was just talking about. Um, a big concern that I see that's very near to my heart but also impacts many of us she leaders and educators brain. is that we are now leading and educating a generation that has different values and practices than we had and may not align with what we did when we were growing up. So being a millennial and being on both sides of the divide, I too must say that I am guilty for wanting those who I lead and educate to adopt my footsteps or, or do things that I did in the past when I was in their situation. Um, but the reality is, is that we have now technology, resources, and tools that we didn't have available then. And I mean, being in this room is a, is a prime example. All of you are innovating, creating new businesses, devices, um, medical technologies, alternative ways of doing things that we didn't do in the past. And um, an example I would like to share is when I first started working as a nursing instructor, I had asked all of my nursing students to write out their medications and make medication cards. I had, I had a nursing student come up to me and say, why am I having to do this? I've purchased medication cards that I have saved on my phone. And my first instinct was to say, well, because that's the way I learned. 
And I'm just curious, how many of you have been in the room and have thought or been in a similar situation? Yeah, yeah. So what I did was I actually took a step back and I thought about it and I said, what is my ultimate goal here? My ultimate goal is for these nursing students to memorize and learn the medications so they can safely administer the medication. And if they're able to do that by having these medication cards saved on their phone, then what is the real issue? And so Einstein once said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And so as leaders, we need to be brave enough to recognize and accept that clinging to past beliefs or asking the new generation to conform to outdated practices isn't going to yield the results that we want. Rather, what we need to do is we need to take a step back and understand and look at what are the needs of this new generation. We need to be empowering them to use the technology, resources, and tools that are available to them now and, and that, that are going to be available to them in the future. We need to really support them to learn, to learn and grow in their unique environment that that they're currently, that's currently changing right now. And as leaders and educators, we need to be willing to do the same. So what we need to do is we need to let go of the belief that things need to be the way they were when we were growing up. And in order to thrive, we really need to understand and accept this. And, and our goal should be to equip those that we lead and educate with the skills and abilities that they need to grow in this time and age rather than reliving the past. That's great. <clears throat> that was great, thank you. You know, I'm gonna change up the questions a little bit here because, you know, I wanna hear from everybody on this. And AI's been brought up a little bit in this conference already. And I wanted to ask the group how you think AI is going to affect the teaching and the learning experiences. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the other questions, but I wanted to kind of throw that in there. So, Bella, do you want to start? Yeah, generative AI has made almost like a virtual coach for some of our young learners. They're finding answers quicker. They know they're getting the response, but doesn't necessarily mean they're always learning. Um, I think when we, a lot of the learning programs are going to have to really rely on more that collaborative and reflective learning that they can learn from their experiences versus just problem solve a, you know, a static. Uh, solution here or develop a solution for that and we're also seeing even though there's such a rise for digital communication and they still want human connection it does not replace that human connection piece and it, developing the right structure that they can have kind of that immersive learning experience for both digitally as well as in person is going to really develop the next generation of um, young children yeah Gina, do you want to say something? I can briefly say something, and it's more like, do we really know? Because I think it's beyond my imagination. I just think what happened in November when chat GPT came, and I thought, I'm, you know, I'm an early adopter, and I started to use it, and I thought, wow, 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 wow. Oh, my English is really good now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, you see, I have dyslexia. Uh, but I have huge imagination and creativity, and I could never get it on a paper. Because, you know, it, it was always this stuff that I can't spell, and language is not really good. But now I just write something very sloppy. Wow, and then Shatty helped me. But I get scared. Because if this happened in six months, what, what, what's going to happen in the next five years? I, I don't know if I can answer the question. I, I don't know. I'm almost a little bit scared, but also very curious. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think we nobody knows exactly, but we do see some trajectories. Uh, do you want to talk about it, Nate, at all? Or? Yeah, sure. I, like, I mean, for me, I think we just need to have a really open mind. Um, like you said, we don't know what's coming. And for me, working in healthcare, I'm, I'm actually excited because the reality is, I mean, right now we're facing a lot of shortages in healthcare, and I think we can really leverage technology once again to meet our end goal, which is to provide safe care to our patients and, and you know, help 
population become healthy and thrive. So I think what, as leaders and educators, we need to be open to seeing what technology has to offer and how we, we can use that in a safe and an efficient manner to meet our goals. Yeah, super well said. So uh, and I want to give a few comments. Sitting in Microsoft where generative AI is kind of being born uh, and in the education space, I've been at kind of the center of it. And it's all of the things that you're saying. It is scary. It is exciting. Uh, we have to make sure that we mitigate the risks. But I'll give you a couple of the use cases just because I, I think that uh, I, I'm more excited than scared. I think we can mitigate the risks. Personalization. So we talked about you know, how do we help reach each student where they are. And AI gives us that ability. It can look at the data. It can look at what we call formative assessments and where students are right now, help them improve any of their content areas, whether it's literacy or numeracy. We can actually help our teachers get better up to speed on what they need to teach. So, and we can have huge productivity and efficiency gains. So our educators are so overworked. They are quitting at record rates and understaffed. And I see a future where our teachers are more facilitators in the classroom and helping students develop interpersonal skills, problem solving, relationship building, conflict management. And the content can be delivered in a multitude of ways through what we might call master teachers that are really, really good at their subject. It's so outdated that we teach the same algebra lesson across every school in the world every single year, right? And you can't tell me that all those teachers teach it as well as the best teacher, right? So if we could capture those master teachers that do that the best, then we can repeat the best education experience. But what students really need, and we go back to uh, uh, mental health and well-being and just overall wellness, they need a human. They need an adult in the classroom that can facilitate presentation skills, problem solving skills, synthesis of information, research, critical thinking. So I see uh, so many of our AI tools being able to help personalize those experiences. And then we have the richness of the data. So AI can be used to analyze huge, huge amounts of data and help the educational leaders both at the higher ed level and the K-12 level, see where the students are and even where the educators are. So I just think there's a huge amount of upside here. Uh, and the challenge is that both our educators and our students need to learn AI. We all need to get very familiar with what AI is and what it isn't so that we can educate others and educate ourselves and feel comfortable with it instead of so scared. And yeah, so we there are LinkedIn Learning, there, and I'm, you know, I'm not doing any advertising yet. There's lots of programs out there to learn about AI. And everybody needs to get more familiar with it, whether you are the educator, so that we can help our students learn about AI and become productive in the workforce. So a little bit of a soapbox, but I think that that's worth, uh, worth sharing. And so now back to what do our educators need to do and what do our students need to learn? I want to ask the group, what are the skills and abilities that our future leaders and teachers must possess to be successful? So Nita, let me start with you this time. Sure. So um, starting off, just building off what Serena was saying, I think the very first skills and ability that a leader and educator must have is an open mind. Um, an open mind to unlearn what they've been doing and an open mind to learn new practices, to learn about AI, to learn about all the evidence that's out there and to be adopting this evidence. We have so much data where we could be doing so much, so many things that are, that are a lot better than what we're currently doing, but it's because people aren't open to seeing what the evidence is showing and, and open to learning new things that we're stuck in the same old practices. The second thing I think that leaders and educators need is courage. So the courage to be willing to change and also the courage to have those conflict resolution skills and those difficult conversations to lead everybody else to adopting those changes because that takes a lot of work. And that just builds on having emotional resilience, having good relational skills, solid communication skills. Those are essential if we really want to move to, from where we are to having a better future and thriving. Tina? I can just continue here because you mentioned something very important that 
Uh, I'm certified both in uh, emotional IQ and in adaptability IQ. And adaptability is the top one skill if you check on LinkedIn what companies are looking for. But it's important to understand what is adaptability. And I think about I'm coaching you know, researchers, scientists, professors. Yeah, are they adaptable? <laughs> yeah, I have tested, I've done the tests, so I know where I score. But the thing is that in order to be adaptable, think about it. That one thing you really mentioned here, you need to be open-minded. Yeah, big picture, curious, willing to learn, but also, you know, able to unlearn. That's one thing. We can train that, we can coach that. But there is a degree of that you must have grit. Grit is super important. That, that you hang on, that you doesn't give up. But think about it again, grit. If you now look on the, on the students that I'm coaching, they have that. They are open-minded. They have grit, but they're not adaptable. So what is the missing link here? Well, adaptability is also connected to your emotional range, whether you're resilient and reactive, and if you believe, you know, almost spiritual here, you know. But you must have hope. So one fact is super important is hope. Because if you don't have hope that it will maybe work and sort of work with yourself to take it day by day, and if I do, I trust something will happen, you are not adaptable. And I think what happened in companies, you have people, they don't believe in the company, they don't have any hope, the world is going under anyway, so then you're not really adaptable. Why? I mean, if I don't believe in that, why should I then learn and learn and adapt and change? So this is adaptability is extremely important to learn about yourself. So I think... Companies and organizations should measure because you can measure adaptability. I have done it, and I scored low. On so <laughs> and I, like, I, I need to work on myself here. But what is my problem is actually fate, you know, that my ability, I, you know, I am a bit reactive, and that holding me back a bit. So can you just spell us something briefly yeah. because we've got to get to the questions, the Q&A. Do you want oh. Do you want to answer a question? Do you want okay. to? Well, I'm in a healthcare, and one of the things that we're, real, you know, as healthcare professionals, are perceived as leaders, right? But they're not really developed always as leaders, and so we're focusing more on just teaching some basic skills, interpersonal skills. The big one, empathy. Right. Empathy, right. and, and for healthcare providers, they work in very fast-paced environments. There's, there's multiple patients in a room, different symptoms, different demands, and taking, teaching them, take a moment, sit down, and listen. <laughs> listen to what they say, and being an empathetic provider translates to better um, a compliance from the patient they have, which is going to drive better outcomes long term. And isn't that what we want as healthcare providers, that people get better? And so that is a big focus in, within our organization as well as teaching some of the basic communication skills so they can be, can be moving away from provider-centric approaches to more patient-centric approaches so we can um, help our patients get better. Right. Oh, so many great answers. I love this. Uh, so I think we're opening up to questions now. We have a couple of minutes. That's how they're changing. And it's this Excellent. quote that I re, re, uh, tell my providers often, people don't care how much you know until you know how much you care. And that yes. is- Yes, uh, love that. Perfect. And that goes for leadership too. You, you can't lead people if you don't show that you care about them first. Questions, any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Um, thank you. 
Um, thank you so much for uh, for this topic. So, um, according to Economic Forum, you know, 2025, one of the um, most important skills is going to be like self-management and self-awareness and self-efficacy. So, everything about the open-minded, you know, like emotional intelligence and um, caring and just looking where they need to look at, they won't be able to do it unless they are aware of themselves. So is there any like a secret sauce or your experience that really helped you to working with the leaders or organization that will help the audience to uh, to learn more, like how we can actually make them more aware? Because most of them or the leaders in the organization, they don't get aware until they hit the wall. And, um, and I think organization and individuals will be benefiting a lot if they do more awareness before that happens. Right. Fantastic question. Who wants to take Nita, you're about to go. Yeah, I could I could add start start off with that. So I think I think the biggest part is self-reflection, like you said. Because I think right now a lot of what happens is a lot of leaders are kind of stuck in the rat race, we'll say, where you know it's go, 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 go. But they need to take a step back and just sitting with them and letting them even speak. You I don't even need to say anything. When I just let them speak and they can hear themselves speaking they can come sometimes see, this is where I'm stuck. Or even just having that reflective, Socratic way of questioning um, really helps them think, yeah, actually, maybe, maybe there is a different way that I should be doing this. But I think it's because, you know, all of the stressors that they're confined with, they're, it, it, you become so tunnel vision that it's hard for you to see elsewhere. But uh, yeah, I think self-reflection is key um, in order to be building self-efficacy. Bella, Bella, Bella. I, from an organization position too, because it's, they have to invest in the development of their people, right? Um, data. So, what does the engagement survey say? Especially if you have a high turnover in a specific role, what does that say? What business problem are we trying to solve? And if we were able to develop our people and retain our talent, what is that going to translate into dollars? Same thing with patients. We get we do surveys to our patient, our net promoter score. It's not the financial cost is the number one reason why they don't continue care with us. It's that they don't have confidence in the, the providers. Um, the, and so it's like, if this is an ongoing issue and it's costing you money, Money, take that, let's invest in our people, and we'll measure. Let's put some um, key performance indicators in there. Let's see what the outcomes of these programs. Pilot in a few areas. If, the, if it works, let's scale it. Tina, this is really your area of expertise. I know you want to jump in here in your coaching practice. Yeah, this is, you know, sort of, it's not a quick fix. So when I come in into companies, it's usually, you know, there's a huge turnover. And I like to share something because I'm from Sweden and, 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 and we had a method that was developed already in the 80s. So it's a really long time ago. There was no name on it, but it's today called the coaching leadership style. That means that the teams that were collectively responsible for the result and actions and they set the goals and the leader was more of a facilitator. And that was changed when we later on the 90s, in the beginning of 2000, many of our companies were bought by American and, and, and English companies, and they had this management style. And suddenly it was, you know, these silos. And, and people start to protect their positions rather than, you know, working collectively together. And this is amazing because when I now come in and I, I, I work as a team coach and executive and leadership coach in corporate companies and American ones, it's so clear that there are these silos and they try to transform the leader, which I work with the managers. But the manager can't be an excellent manager if the team is working against the manager. And if there is complete dysfunctional sort of communication inside the company because you have these silos and everything is just optimized. And I say, you know, hey, 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 we need to take a structured analyzing on where are the links? I call it the links in the companies that I need to coach. Because if things are working here, I don't need to coach here. <laughs> But I need to find the links, so I coach there. And then I must work both with the managers, and it must be all the way from up to down. It, you can't only start here and think, yeah, we need to change up here. So there is a much more collective thinking. So I say, if you just imagine how it wants to work in a team, and I could go to the manager and say, we fix it in the team, and the manager, fine, do it. And we did. 
and we had trust doing it. And I could go across to different managers. No one said anything about that. So I think this is super important that it's not the quick fix, but the coaching leadership style, building trust and coaching connections in the company, so involving team, is super important. So true. You want to finish? Yeah, there's just one little comment that I just wanted to add to that. I think um, in order for any organization to achieve that, there must be a safe environment where people are ha have the mindset that it's okay to do things wrong or fail. Because through failure is where you learn and grow. And having that safe environment where you're able to do that is what's really going to help build self-efficacy. Self so true. So true. Peter, we have one question and then one here and then... Uh, then and we've got to make our answers quick to get, fit them in. Oh, sorry. Is it me? Is it me? Oh, oh, okay. Go ahead. I, I just have a real quick question. What are you seeing um, in the trends with companies when they're hiring in the first place? Because if you're not having a strong, structured interview process, you're setting somebody up to fail when they come in. And number two, once they're hired, what are you seeing with the onboarding process? Because that's another place where you can just lose out big time if those two things are not strong and structured in the beginning. You have something, somebody coming in and they're just floundering throughout their time with your company. Um, I'll quickly answer that and Bella, you can add on. So something that actually I've, I've noticed, especially in healthcare, is often people are being placed into leadership positions based off of the years of seniority or being a good clinician, not based off of the leadership competencies. And, and even the onboarding process, it's, well, this person's been in this organization for this long, so they should already be a good leader. Uh, not necessarily recognizing that the skill set and competencies needed for leadership is completely different. Yeah, same thing. I, I think because there's such a workforce shortage, I think they're just plugging people to fill roles out of need and not really thinking about developing that person or understanding where their uh, capability gaps are so they can be successful in their role. And then this is what's leading to burnout and higher turnover. And it's like we're going this um, wheel that's not really productive for anyone. It's doing a disservice all across the board. So I know organizations have been hyper focused, and especially after the pandemic, with their talent development space. If they want to continue to grow, they're going to have to really look and do more talent mapping, see who, who and kind of calibrate their manager to say, okay, and this competencies. is how, yeah, co competencies and calibrate, okay, well, this is where you would like to promote it. Let's put them in front of your peers. Why? And get them all calibrated. And then the high potentials that are identified, let's design a development plan uh, for them so that we can expose them and to the different varieties of the roles, their expanded functions, and then when there's an opportunity that opens, we can move them up right away. Do we have time for one more? Or Okay, right here. So I'll just answer real quick from my perspective is because we get asked this question a lot, you know, what is going to happen to all the creativity? And what I'm seeing and hearing is that you can use AI for your start. So no more blank page syndrome. So a lot of times really good writers are just like, where do I start? And you can do an outline, you can do a first draft. The AI is not the final draft. If you're in advertising, you can have the AI generate a hundred new ideas and then develop the five that you like. So it's, it's a start and it's not an end. So the creative process still remains. It just gives you more information. If you have to do a lot of research, you can leverage AI to do the research so that then you can do the creative writing part. So, and you know, I think it's never gonna get automated that somebody tells our story. So the stories you're hearing from this group and from all of you and what has made this conference so amazing is that human contact and hearing personal stories. AI cannot automate personal stories. They can only, it can only do fiction or take what's already been written.
I just have um, a comment to make. When it comes to the AI, of course, I'm a huge fan of AI being incorporated into the healthcare industry because of the benefits. But when it comes to the educational system, I have significant drawbacks because we, as a prior educator um, in, in nursing, I see that if we don't teach the basic fundamentals and if we depend upon just AI, we will lose out. We're going to tremendously lose out when it comes to paper writing, just using your, your, your thought processes, using your brain, right. to lack of a better so, word, to do what needs to be done. Because when we come to something, for an example, when we came up with the logic of the cash register, a lot of people cannot count back the change that they should already know how to do. And if we venture for more into AI right. with having the intellect to be given to us by a AI, the intellect will decrease, dummy down us, where in the education system, we need to know the fundamentals, the basic, because right. once we have seen through the pandemic, when they decide to shut us down, when they decide to not allow us to have any use of any of what we have become dependent upon, then where are we? And if we allow ourselves to go into the future totally dependent, that's where a lot of our students are, mm -hmm. totally dependent on the AI to provide the answers and to be the solution, we are going to set right. ourselves so, up for so failure. You're absolutely right. We cannot rely on AI for the process. That's why when we got calculators, we still had to teach long division. We still need to teach the thought process behind it. But once students have mastered long division, they don't need to keep doing it when they're doing algebra. And it's the same thing with AI. You need to learn the process. You need to learn the process of writing, the process of creating, the process of doing all that work. And then you can use it to go beyond. So you're, you're absolutely right, but I want to let Tina speak. Yeah, just one second. There is, you know, people that they knew that, you know, the calculator came. And what they found out was that in order to use the calculator efficiently, the one that could use paper, pen, and the head, they used also the calculator more, more, more efficiently. So it's not so that you can just use a tool and everything will be completely easy for you. And, and the onus is on the educator to change their practice and not just say, oh, go write a paper. They have to have the student Turn in your outline, turn in your notes, turn in your, right? So educators have to be more diligent and less kind of lazy about their practices too. Thank you so much to our panel. This is an amazing conversation. Thank you, Serena. Thank you, Dr. Tina. Thank you, Dr. Nita. Thank you, Bella. Mm -hmm.